Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event with Girls in Tech in partnership with Foundry. Um, it's called Career Stories at Foundry because you'll be hearing um, an inspiring uh, journey along with uh, tips and tricks on um, how you might have an opportunity to join the tech space, but more, uh, more importantly, uh, um, Foundry as a company. Um, for the first time joiners, it's very nice to meet you. Um, my name is Irene and I'm the head of partnerships at Girls in Tech London. Um, if you uh, continue to join um, different events, welcome back and thank you so much for, um, for, for being part of our community. Let me tell you a little bit about um, Girls in Tech um, to, to kick us off. So Girls in Tech London officially launched last year as the London chapter of the Global Girls in Tech NGO um, that is focused on engagement, education, and empowerment of women in technology. Girls in Tech London aspires to serve as a platform for young professionals to enter, accelerate, and maximize their careers in the tech industry. And we bring this to life through bespoke events such as this one, um, and uh, uh, along with fireside chats, hackathons, webinars, talent acquisition campaigns, and all kinds of networking events um, among different formats. So um, before I give the floor to the founder team to introduce um, themselves and tell you what they have prepared for you today, I want to let you know that this video is recorded because we want to build a kind of webinar format. Um, so, and, you know, feel free to uh, participate, uh, kind of take notes, and of course, uh, write down questions in the chat. But of course, the founder team will give you a bit more uh, details on when you you be able to participate. So without further ado, let me give the floor to the founder team. Thanks, Irene. Um, hi, welcome. Um, so I'm Chloe Campbell. Um, I am a talent partner at Foundry and I am joined today with um, Chloe Park, a recruiter at Foundry um, and Olivia Maria Grogan, our senior research engineer as well. Um, so in terms of what we are doing here, well, actually, let's start with who are we and what is Foundry? Um, so Foundry is a leading software development company for the VFX industry. Our vision is to bring Unreal and real worlds together. And um, so the impossible is made possible. And we're pretty good at it. Um, so we've got a number of products within the company, um, including Nuke, it's a node-based compositing tool. We've got Katana, it's a tool for like development and lighting. Um, Flix is our pre-production storyboard application. Mary is painting and texturing. And Modo is our 3D modeling tool. So whatever show, movie you're watching and whatever streaming channel or platform that you're currently on, those visual effects um, will likely have been created with the help of our tools. Um, so that's a little bit about us um, and our lovely show reel. So now that we know a bit about Foundry, let's talk about what we're actually here for today. So today we're going to hear Maria's story and how she ended up as a senior research engineer at Foundry. We're going to give you some tips and tricks on how to develop your skills and reach your potential. And we're going to talk about interviewing and hiring at Foundry and other tech companies, along with actually what we are doing to help increase the number of girls in tech. So to get us started, I'm going to hand you over to the lovely Maria and she'll talk to you about her journey. Thanks, Chloe. Um... So yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Mairead. I'm a senior research engineer at Foundry um, and I'm working as part of the research team in the areas of machine learning and AI or artificial intelligence. Um, and as part of the presentation today, I'm going to give an overview of how I came to be where I am today and um, some of my career to date. Um, and I guess I want to share some tips and tricks on things I picked up along the way and things that might help you on your career in tech. Um, and finally, I want to give you some inspiration and give you some insight into some of the things that you can do or work on in tech um, and some of the really interesting projects that I've been a part of um, over the last couple of years. Um, so I'll start by, I guess, taking you back to where it all started um, and how I got to be a research engineer in like the visual effects space. Um, so going all the way back to, to secondary school, I guess I enjoyed both you know, scientific subjects like science or biology, chemistry and maths and artistic ones like English and art. And when I was trying to decide what to study at university, I was very torn between the two and could, couldn't figure out which which subject to choose. Um, and in the end, after a lot of a lot of debate, um, I decided to, to study maths. 
Um, so I spent three years doing a degree in Ireland, in Dublin, um, just on it, it was a math degree, so it was a three-year math degree. Um, I have to say, I I really loved the subject, and um, there was some things about it that really ticked all the boxes for me. Um, one of the main things I loved about it was the problem-solving aspect. Um, that's what I loved about doing maths in school. Um, you'd be given a hard problem, and you know, you know, there could be ten or eleven different ways to solve it, but you have to try and find the best one or the quickest one or the one that works works the best. Um, the other thing I liked about maths was finding different connections between different parts of the subject. Um, I have to say, I couldn't find any at the beginning, but as I got further into the degree towards maybe final year, you'd start to see things crop up in different modules that were connected. You'd be working in one area that would seem completely different to another, but you'd start to see the same maybe theories or or ideas cropping up in both of them. And it was this, this kind of finding these hidden connections that I really enjoyed um, when I was studying maths. But I have to say, I did find the subject a little bit too abstract for me. Um, I wanted to get stuck into problems that were more applied and more grounded in the real world. Um, so at the end of my degree, when I was trying to figure out what to do next, um, I had a good think. And I actually remembered someone had told me a couple of years earlier that Pixar, um, the animation studio, is actually a huge employer of mathematicians. Um, this really surprised me. I find it really interesting, but I couldn't really see the connection. Um, but if you think about the types of problems that have to be solved when creating animations and movies, um, you start to see why people with maths or tech skills are really important. Um, so if you think about some of the movies that have been made by animation studios like Pixar or Disney, um, if you think about Frozen, um, it's set in a world that's completely covered in snow and ice. And when creating those kind of landscapes, um, the animators have to make sure that the snow and ice behaves in the same way as it would in the normal world. So if someone stands on the snow, it has to leave a footprint. And if there's an icicle hanging, um, it has to refract light in the same way as it would in, in the real world. And that's to make sure that we as viewers believe that this is something that could, could really be happening. Um, it's the same with something like Monsters, Inc. If you think about the, the main character there, it's, it's covered in fur. So every one of those little pieces of hair have to interact with each other and they have to be able to interact with things like wind. And they have to do it in a way that we believe because we have to believe that that's a, possibly a real monster with something that could actually happen in, in realistically and in the real world. Um, and again, if anyone has seen Moana, um, it's a film that was set in the sea. Um, and in this film, you have characters of boats and, and the wind all interacting with water. And in the same way, you have to make sure that that water is realistic and that it behaves and moves in the right ways. Otherwise, we as viewers just won't believe it and, and you lose that, that connection with the film. So when I realized all of this, um, I decided this was the area that I wanted to work in. I wanted to work in this intersection between movie making and, and tech and science. So knowing that, um, I researched some courses that could take, help me take my skills, my math skills, and and I suppose plant them into this, this little computer science area. Um, and I found a one-year master's degree in computer science that would allow me to study computer graphics and computer vision and image processing. Um, but I will start by saying, I have never been tech savvy. Um, I wasn't into gaming or computers. I wasn't building my own computer and teaching myself to code at the age of 12. I didn't really have a great interest in computer science before I found this master's and decided that this is what I wanted to do. So to be honest, I did come in to the master's with some preconceived notions about the types of people that I would meet along the way. Um, firstly, I assumed that everyone would be interested in computers and gaming and coding from a young age. I kind of felt like I was going to join and already be a decade behind everyone because I hadn't been interested in these things. Um, I also assumed there would be very few women on the course and that even the women that were there, I wouldn't really have much in common with. I didn't think I'd have anything in common with anyone in the course, really. Um, but I have to say, these were complete misconceptions that I had and a couple of days into my master's they were completely debunked and um, obviously there were people there with strong computer science backgrounds who did love gaming and, and loved coding um, but there were also people from different backgrounds like maths and physics or more creative backgrounds like art um, and while there were more men and women um, I think there were three women out of 15 in my master's 
I met lifelong friends in that master's group. I met people that I had loads in common with and I got on really well with and um, similar to any group of people that you would meet in any walk of life. So while we can have preconceived notions and stereotypes about the types of people that study tech or computer science, we shouldn't really pay attention to any of them because it's not realistic of the mix of people that you're going to work with or that you're going to meet when you're working in this sector in real life. Now, obviously, when you do a computer science master's, it means you need to know how to code. Um, and now I, I did touch on a little bit of code in my maths degree, but it was a language called Maple and no one has even heard of it. It was very, very basic. Um, but for my master's, I needed to know C++ and Python. And I hadn't touched either of these before. Um, and basically the, the coding that I had was, was very standard and very basic. So I had to teach myself how to code um, in the three months prior to starting my master's. Um, and I have to say it was very daunting and it can be very daunting to jump into learning a new skill from scratch. So um, I wanted to share some of the tricks and tips and tricks that I learned along the way when I was trying to trying to teach myself um, way back then. Um, and I guess the first thing I wanted to mention is that I think it's so useful to, to read books and read tutorials and use online resources, but make sure you start from the beginning. Um, I remember when I did my undergrad in maths, a lecturer might say, oh, jump into chapter nine and 10 and read this and it, you'll understand it. And then jump into chapter six of this other book and, and it'll give you a good oversight. When it comes to teaching yourself something from scratch, always start at chapter one, whether it be the book or the tutorial. Because if you jump into the middle thinking, oh, I know a bit, I'll jump into the middle, you might find yourself feeling lost and feeling confused. And that's not the way to go in. If you read from page one, you will have all of the references and you have all the information and it it put you at ease when you're learning it. So I think um, that's that's the tip, the first tip I would give. Um, find the resources that work best for you. Um, I know for me, I used a mix of books and online exercises and online tutorials and that worked for me. But figure out what works for you because people learn in different ways and everyone's different. So give a, give a couple of them a, a try and see which one um, suits you the best. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I definitely came into a master's having barely any computer science background and asked, all of the questions of the day. Um, don't be daunted by it. Everyone's willing to help and, and will answer any questions you have. But if you're a bit worried about putting yourself on the spot, write down any phrases you don't know and Google them later. Um, I did the exact same thing. So anything that's unfamiliar, jot it down and, and take a look at it when you get back home. Um, it's, it's, it's the best way to, to keep on top of any of these new phrases and terms that you're hearing along the way. Um, when it comes to coding, Having a good understanding of the basics will stand to you. Everything's based on for statements or for loops and while loops and if statements. If you know that, you'll be able to transition it across multiple different languages. So do get a bare bones and a good understanding of the basics and that will definitely stand to you. And don't compare yourself to other people. People will, will be learning this or have done this at, for different amounts of time. Um, I definitely was, was surrounded by people who have been doing it for longer or other people who hadn't been doing it, had been doing the same amount of time as me. Don't compare yourself to others. This is your journey to learn and to learn how to code. And um, it's just better not to, not to compare yourself and take it at your speed and you'll figure it out and you'll get there. Um, so I guess next, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the projects that I got to take part in over the course of my master's. Um, one that I find really interesting was the idea of watercolour rendering. Um, say we had this 3D model of this hedgehog on the left-hand side. Um, most of the time, these 3D models are rendered or coloured in using standard 3D rendering techniques. So you get something that would look like this hedgehog in the middle. Um, and you can just imagine he might appear in it films like Frozen or Toy Story. He's very standard and very well rendered and, and looks very good. But what if you wanted to make the hedgehog look like it had been painted with watercolour paints instead? Um, in this case, you can actually model how the watercolour paint moves across that bumpy watercolour paper and how it dries over time and leaves maybe fainter lines towards the edges of those brush strokes. And using the maths and the equations, you can make this hedgehog look like it was painted with these watercolour paints. And that's the kind of result you would get here on the right hand side. 
Um, I also got a chance to look at simulating fluids. So learning how particles like snow and water are affected by gravity or each other. Um, and you, we, I learned how you can use these kind of physics simulations to generate waterfalls or fountains or waves like this one here. And these are the same kinds of equations that um, artists and animators would use um, to create the ice and water landscapes in films like Frozen and Moana. And then over the summer of that master's, I actually got my first taste of research. So I had a three month um, research project, I was given a problem and had to try and solve it. Um, and I loved it. Um, it was a problem solving at its best where you get to come up with new and exciting ideas and um, probably very basic at that stage of my career, <laughs> but new and exciting ideas anyway to solve a problem. Um, and because I loved it so much, I decided to, to keep on the research track and I did a three year PhD and a three year postdoc. Um, which basically just means that I was researching in academia and within the um, um, in the academic environment for about six years. So reading and writing research papers, going to conferences and talking to other academics or postdocs about their ideas or my ideas. Um, and one of the projects I got to work on was one about colour correction or colour transfer. So say you had the image here on the left hand side where you have this girl and she's quite purple and, and, and lilac toned. And say you want to change the colour scheme completely. Um, I came up with tools that would allow you to, to do that so that you could change maybe one part of the image and another part so that it would have a completely different colour feel to it. Um, and again, this is about understanding colours and how they work together and how to change colours without changing the rest of the image. Another kind of area I got to work in was image compositing. So say you had this image here, of this fire um, by the beach and you want to edit it in some way. One of the ways that you can do this is you can take the image and split it into different parts. So one part might capture that blue background um, another would capture the tree and then some of those layers or images might capture that fire. And what's nice is that you can move these layers about, you can remove some of the background, you can shift that fire onto a completely different background altogether. So you would get the images that, on the right here so you could change the blue sky to something that's green or you could move the fire completely so that it's no longer by a lakeside but by the beach. So again, this is all about understanding images and trying to edit them and, and make tools that allow artists to create these kinds of edits. And again, I have to say the things I loved about research were very similar to the things I loved um, back in my maths degree. So things like um, getting a hard problem and trying to come up with a really nice solution. Um, also finding those connections. I think that's a huge part of research is that you might read a paper or see something that's happening in, in one area of research that you think is completely different to the problem you're solving. But sometimes you can find these connections and these ties between two completely different areas and it means you can bring a solution from one space into another and it could be a brand new way to solve a problem. And I think it's finding these kind of connections and, and hidden ties between areas that's really important and something we do quite regularly in research. And again, I find it quite creative. So you coming up with new creative ways of doing something, coming up with a way that no one had ever thought of or different to the, the person who solved it before you. Um, it's a really nice way to, to bring creativity into work. And I think it, it definitely feeds into the creative side of my um, personality anyway. But I have to say, um, as I was working in academia, there was one thing I was finding frustrating. Um, and that was how far away I was from the end user of any of the tools I was creating. So I was publishing papers and going to conferences and chatting to academics, but there was no product at the end of the day. There was no way for me to get the things I was making into the hands of an artist to get feedback from them about whether it was working correctly or whether it was in any way useful at all. And I have to say, that's what I really wanted. So I really wanted to be um, more within that, that feedback loop. Um, so four years ago, I decided to join um, industry research. So I decided to move from academia into industry. And I joined the research team at Foundry to do just that. Um, and what's really nice about Foundry is that within the research team, I get to continue working in tech and solving those nice hard research problems that I've been doing for years. But I get to stay in the visual effects and moving making industry. And I think um, that's what's really important to me. That's exactly why I do what I do. It's because I want to be in that really exciting, interesting industry. And I think Foundry is a great place to, to get both the research and, and that 
um, really cool, really cool movie, movie making industry um, experience. Um, and as I've mentioned, within the research team, I'm working on machine learning and AI. And I guess in the last couple of years in the area of computer graphics and image processing that I've kind of shown you some of the projects that I've been working on before. Um, in the last couple of years, that whole area has become dominated by machine learning. So machine learning is a really powerful way to solve the hard problems that we had tried to solve, but maybe more traditional methods before. So within the research team at Foundry, we get to dig into these new machine learning techniques that are coming on the market and being proposed. And we try and bring them into the hands of our customers and into the hands of our artists. So I guess in the next couple of slides, I just want to touch on some of the tech that's out there and some of the things that's being done at the state of the art in machine learning, in visual effects um, and image processing. Um, and one of the machine learning tools that has become really popular in the last couple of years is this to these tools around aging and de-aging. So if you take a look at the, the man on the left here, we can make him look years older or years younger using these kinds of machine learning tools. So by passing it into one of these tools, you could get the results on the right here. So you can see he's a few more wrinkles on his forehead around his eyes and his jaws are a little bit bigger. Um, so he's he's been aged with these machine learning tools. And this is really popular and this is really important in visual effects because you can see that actors and actresses are getting aged and de-aged in films all the time. And it's this kind of tech that's going to make that easier and more feasible um, if we get this into our tools. Another um, big... I guess, um, method that has become popular in, in the last couple of years is this idea of image generation. Um, it, basically, what you do is you would take a sense describing a particular thing um, or a particular idea that you might have, and you would type it in and you would pass it to this machine learning algorithm. And what it would do is it would generate an image describing or, or that is exactly what your sentence had described. So say you passed in a sentence that said a man in India sitting meditating near the Ganges River. You pass that into the algorithm and it would give you this image here as output. And I mean, this is a completely realistic, photorealistic image. It would be very hard to know that this was in any way AI generated. And again, this is really important in the area of visual effects and, and image and um, idea generation because you can just see how people might type these in to try and think of um, how they would set up a scene or, or generate some ideas on, on what kind of scenes they could create. Um, so it's a really important type of technology that's, that's been cropping up in visual effects recently. And not only can we do this for um, images, but we can also do this for videos. So um, in this case, not you, you would pass in this sentence, a shot following a hiker through jungle brush and um, this time it would generate a video sequence for you instead of just a single image. Um, you can actually, it actually looks a bit pixelated and a bit low res in this case, but I've actually seen results of this in the last couple of weeks and they've made this a lot better. This is moving really quickly, this area. So these results that might've been state of the art a couple of months ago are now being way outblown by the new results that are coming out in the, in the last couple of weeks. Um, but again, you can see that this kind of concept of passing in a single idea and getting images and videos generated as a result um, is really powerful and getting that into the hands of artists um, is, is amazing. So then within Foundry ourselves, um, we're working on creating, as I said, creating these machine learning tools and getting them to our artists. Um, and some of the tools we've created include upscale or super resolution tools. So you can see here on the, um, left hand side, we have an image of a kitten or a cat and it's quite low resolution. So the results are quite pixelated and you can't really see all the details of the fur. But if you look at the image on the right hand side here, you can start to see this has been run through our machine learning super resolution too. And you can start to see that fur around the ears and the whiskers. Um, so you see the minute details now. And um, this is one of the tools that we have available for, for um, our customers at Foundry. Um, another thing that we've created is a human segmentation or human matting tool. So in this case, you would pass in an image of a person or a couple of people in, a, in any kind of scene. 
And what the tool would do is it would label the people or mask out the people, um, like you can see on the right hand side here. And if you can imagine why this would be um, useful, you can imagine that artists might want to say darken the background or brighten up the foreground to make the person look um, more highlighted or more in focus. They might even blur the background and just keep the person in focus, or they might want to remove that person from that background altogether. So once they have that mask, they can do all of these kind of edits to this image to make it look exactly like they want. And then another tool that we've created or made available is a depth estimation tool. So say you had um, this image of this guy on the bike um, and what our tool will do is it will estimate or give you the depth of each of the objects in this image. So if you look at the pillar here, it's lying quite close to the camera. It's that bit closer to the camera. So it's appearing red in this depth image. And then you can see the, the building behind the guy on the bike. Um, it's coming up as black in this depth image because it's really far away. And the reason these kinds of things are important is, can you imagine if you had to add an object in behind the cyclist um, and the camera was moving and the objects were moving, you would need to know the depth at which you have to add that object in order to be able to add it in in a realistic way so that when the camera moves, it also stays in the right location. So these kind of depth maps really help with that kind of image processing and that image editing as well. And again, they're essential when it comes to VFX or visual effects artists um, creating the effects that they need. Um, so I guess I've touched on some of the some of the really interesting research that is going on and that we're looking into. Um, but I wanted to give you a bit of an overview into what my day to day life looks like or how how we take an idea from research and bring it into product and what that life cycle looks like. Um, and I guess it, it's kind of split into four different phases. Um, at the very beginning, we spend a bit of time investigating any new technologies. So any new interesting ideas that we see popping up and um, we'll spend some time looking into it. That would mean reading research papers, looking at what's happening at conferences, looking at articles online, seeing how people um, are using it and how the technology actually works. Um, after we've done that, we would typically prototype, prototype a feature. So we might um, code it and, and create it in Python maybe, or download the code from online and, and try and see how it works. Apply it to some of the images that our artists would typically use. And we see how we could edit or tweak it in order to make it work within our artist workflows and see what features we might have to add to make it in any way useful. Um, and once we've decided that the, the prototype works and it, it's nice and we want to get it into our products, the next step is getting it into C++ development. So all of our products that we make available to customers are written in C++, which means that we have to take anything that we've prototyped maybe in Python um, or PyTorch and transfer that then into C++ so that we can get it into our products. Um, that would be the next phase of development. And then um, after that comes the actual release. So within the products that I work on, we release every six months. So it means that every six months of the year, we get to get features into the hands of our customers. And um, so every six months, we tend to we tend to split it up into what features we want to develop and, and, and get out there. And um, so when it comes to these release cycles, I guess it's, it's quite a, a busy time of getting everything in and getting our features in and maybe fixing some of those bugs that we had introduced at the C++ development phase when we were, when we were doing the development at the beginning. Um, but that's the point where we actually get things finalized and get things into product and release it into customers' hands. So that's the, the four stages of this kind of cycle from taking an idea from, from research where it's in papers and, and being chatted about at conferences. And we actually get it into our product and get it released into customers' hands. Um, and I guess I just wanted to go through some general tips and tricks next that I have come across in the last couple of years um, in my career in tech. I just wanted to share with you guys in case in case it was interesting. Um, I think a big one is that the internet is your friend. You have, there are so many resources available online, um, so many tutorials and free online courses and books and papers. Um, use it and make the most of it and, and download and read and, and use it to read up on papers and articles and code snippets. And there's so many examples available that um, you really can teach yourself anything now these days, any new skills with all of the resources that are available there. So, so definitely make the most of that. Um, 
it might seem like every, some people know everything, but no one knows everything. So don't be worried if, if you find that you're confused about something and you don't know something. Google it. Use the internet again. Use There's a lot of forums online like Stack Overflow where people ask every question you could possibly think of has been asked online. So if you're coming across a problem, something's not working with Mac or Linux, Google it and its answer is probably there. And remember that no one knows everything and everyone is doing this. So um, don't be afraid to rely on the internet to give you answers to things. Um, again, coming back to that, don't be afraid to ask questions. And um, if you come across something that you don't know, definitely speak up and ask or write it down and Google it later um, because that's the best way to keep on top of anything that you're, you're feeling confused about. Um, another big thing I would mention is um, applying for jobs and courses and going to interviews. Um, when it came to me doing my master's, I didn't think I was qualified enough. I didn't think I had enough of a computer science background to get into my master's, but I applied anyway. And it was the best thing I ever did. And I, I honestly don't know where I'd be if I, if I hadn't done it. And it was a huge lesson to me that you know there's no harm in putting your cv in for things just stick it in you're never going to lose anything by applying for something the worst that can happen is you don't get it and you were there anyway it's you know you're no worse off so definitely apply for the jobs um apply for the courses and go to the interviews interviews are great ways to learn skills on interviewing so i mean interviewing itself is a skill so definitely don't be afraid to do those things they can only help you um, and the other thing I would say is to follow what you enjoy. Um, if you find something really motivating and really interesting, you're going to find it easier to learn more on that subject. You're going to find it easier to dig into the problems around it and try and figure out how it works. And mm -hmm. um, you'll be motivated in your day-to-day -day job and you'll be motivated by the problems that you have to tackle. So if you find something in the area that you're working in that you enjoy, try and keep on that track and keep following that because it'll make your life easier at the end of the day if you're motivated and enjoy what you're working on. Um, and finally, I just wanted to share some tips and tricks on, on tackling some gender imbalance that we can see in the tech industry. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is not to let male dominated work environments scare you off. Um, I obviously have been working in male dominated environments for the last decade, but um, it's been great. I have to say I haven't had any problems or any issues. I think it can be just as fun as working in any other um, environment. So don't let the fact that there could be less females than males put you off from going into a tech role or from picking up a, a course in tech. Um, it's it's not it's it's not a very big deal. So <laughs> to apply on and keep going and apply for it and don't let it stop you. Um, do you be aware of any preconceived ideas or biases that you might have about the people in tech? Um, as I mentioned, I had them going into to work in computer science for the first time, and I think we can all have them. We can all have this idea of the stereotypes of the people that work in tech or computer science. Um, so just be aware of that and be aware that you might have biases as well as other people and try and debunk those before you let them change your path or change your route or just be aware that they're probably misconceived um, and they, you know we have these preconceived notions but don't pay much attention to them because when you get into these areas you realize that um, it's not like that at all. Um, reach out to women in, in roles within tech. I think having role models, when female role models within tech is really important. Being able to see someone who's in a position that you want to be in, in a couple of years time can be really helpful and really motivating. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to those women to ask them how they got there or to ask them for advice if you feel like it would be helpful to you. Um, it's, you know, I think everyone is willing to help and, and help with these things, especially in the tech sector. So, so do reach out to other women in similar roles and see if they can offer you any advice on how they got there and how you might get there too. Um, imposter syndrome is a real thing. Um, it can affect women a lot more than men. I know I've had it over the course of my career. Um, just be aware that you know, if you start feeling like you've tricked your way into something and then maybe you shouldn't be there and people are going to realise it, just realise that that is imposter syndrome. Talk to people. To, I, I know I've chatted to friends and some of them have experienced it too. Everyone kind of feels like that 
at some point everyone kind of feels like they don't know 100% what's going on and, and that they're trying to get through some parts of shuffling their way through some parts of life it's just the way it is people don't talk about it all that much though so um just don't let it stop you from progressing or or from continuing to progress in your career be aware that it is a thing and and if you feel like you're feeling this way um chat someone and try and see if you can combat that um and be aware that you can be a role model for future women coming into tech if you're in a position where you are looking at at the leaders within your within your career path or within where you want to be and you don't see any women there if that can happen um we're at this part of life i guess where um there are a lot more men than women in in tech at the minute which means there can be more men than women in those leadership roles um but we are at this this point of change where um it might not happen be happening now, but in 10 or 15 years, you could be the person that's in the leadership role that will inspire people coming into tech in five or 10 years time. So even if you don't see a woman, you know, a couple of steps ahead of you in your career path, just be aware that you can be the inspiration for the, for the person coming down the line in a couple of years time. And I think that's really important to remember as well. So, yeah, so that's me. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, I hope, I hope it was all understandable enough. And I uh, think I'll pass it back to Alexia now, um, just in case there's anyone had any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mirad. Um, perfect. So we had a few questions. Um, anyone, if you haven't uh, had the chance to post, please do now if you have any questions. Um, so we had two questions about coding. Maybe let's start with those. Um, so the first one was about the websites that you used for coding. Uh, so maybe you can share that. Yeah, I'd actually, I might, um, I could share links afterwards if if that's okay, because there are a couple of different resources and I know I've used um, online tutorials as well. And there are some good online courses available um, that are for free as well. So I think if if there was an email address, I can actually send some links. I don't know if I can remember them off the top of my head, but um, that's fine. You know, I think I think there are some great books as well. Um, I would Google. I think you can, if you Google the best five books in C plus plus or Python, there are some standard ones that crop up, and I think I've taken a look at them over over the years as well. But again, That's I can fine. send on a list. We'll share afterwards some links from you then. Um, one more on that, and then we have three more minutes. Um, so. Um, someone mentioned that C++ is quite a difficult language to learn yes. compared to others. So how did you find it? Yes, I think that was the big thing. It is is a very different um, kind of coding language to the ones I had used before. And to be honest, I'm still learning C++. Um, I've been doing it now since. So I, I've been doing it for 10 years, but I'm still learning. And I think that's the thing you have to remember about C++ is you can come in and, and know how to code and how to get things into a prototype level. But then when it comes to really knowing how to do memory management and how to make sure your code is really optimized, that takes another you know level of development. And I think when it comes to coding, you can continue to learn throughout your career. And I think that's the main thing Absolutely. to remember is that I'm still learning and I'm still reading more books and you start to read the more advanced ones as you get further and further on. So um, I think it's all a learning process and you constantly pick up new things and learn new things. Um, I wouldn't let it be daunting. That's why I'd say always start at the beginning. Everyone, everyone did. So even if it is a difficult language, it's not a hard language to get quick prototypes up in. Um, it's an easy enough one to, to get things up and running. It's just when it comes to those harder, lower level things, it can be a bit more difficult. But that takes time and experience. And you don't have to do that all in day one. Thank you. Um, let's aim for two more. So next one, um, what has been your favorite project you've worked on? Yeah, um, I really loved the color correction work that I did. So I spent a couple of years dabbling in, in color and, and trying to understand color. And I guess for me, it was, um, I, I love color anyway in my in my everyday life I think like being able to paint and things with, with really bright colors I, I love it so when I got to understand how color works and understand all the different aspects of color um I've really enjoyed that so I did I spent a couple of years working on projects where you could allow artists to edit different colors and with different tools and that was that was the one I enjoyed the most Great, thank you. Um, and last one. Um, so 
someone said um was asking around mentors so did you have any mentors throughout your career and if so what role did they play for you yeah um I have to say having females seeing females in in leadership positions was really important to me I know when I went into my master's <clears throat> again I was expecting all of the lecturers to be male and there was two or three female lecturers who were brilliant and I picked one of them as my PhD supervisor and she was amazing especially that was the very beginning I guess of my career and she had a huge influence on me and it was great to see her striving in her career and she gave me so much advice um, and it continued I think um, I there was people I reached out to when I did my postdoc um, and then within um foundry and within my role of foundry there are so many great yeah. females that I work with that I got on with and um I haven't had I guess a mentor since I did my postdoc and my my PhD um but I know how important they were to me to build my confidence and to to kind of get used to the the area. It's so nice to have a female female leader to help you with that. Great. Thank you. Um, so now you've all heard from uh, Mira and her fascinating story from being a student to now an experienced professional at Foundry. Um, we'll now move on. We have 15 minutes left. So uh, yeah, you'll now hear from Chloe Campbell and Chloe Park, uh, who will cover recruitment at Foundry, as well as some tips and tricks. Thank Over you very you. much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So my name is Chloe Parr. I am a recruiter here at Foundry. Um, myself and Chloe Campbell, we will start our presentation by giving you some tips about the getting interviews at tech companies. So I would like to start to talk about what's a good CV. CV is your face and it's most likely that recruiters will take a first look at it. And I can honestly say I deal with dozens and hundreds of um, CVs daily basis, weekly basis. So the first thing I wanna say is that make it quite compact, no, no more than two papers, two pages, let's say, and it should be quite easy to read that I understand what you're trying to say. It could be about education or projects or experiences, but it needs to have the essential skills that we're looking for. For example, I came across so many CVs that doesn't have C++ on their CV, even though that's our bread and butter. Even if you know Java, for instance, if you don't put enough for it on your CV, recruiters would not know and likely to pass on. Another funny thing is about typos. You will be very surprised how many hiring majors will pass on a CV because it has too many typos, although the experiences or skills that look quite relevant. So make sure that you are happy with your grammars and words and typos in your CV for sure. It actually takes no more than 10 seconds for us to see if this CV has potential or not. So these are the reasons that why the first impression of the CV is really, really important. You don't have to put any um, details such as like ages or anything like that. However, you have to put kind of requirements, essential skills that you're looking for, or if it's a researcher, for example, for Murray's, they usually look for quite specific um, degree or master's degree type of thing. So make sure that you have all the important, important things on your CV. You cannot expect recruiters to assume or expect that, oh, this person might have a potential. No, you are competing with dozens and dozens of people. So make sure of that. Um, the other part that I wanna cover is LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, please go ahead. It, not only Foundry, but all the tech companies, we are very active on um, LinkedIn. It's not just about posting the job, but it's also about company updates or industry knowledge or news that's important for the company. So um, whenever we look for people, um, let's say recruit people, uh, the headhunt, the headhunting, we go LinkedIn and find people. Make sure you have um, very recent CV on there or all the skills that you're comfortable and confident with. So that's kind of my part here, Gracie. Thank you. Um, so the next bit is take your time deciding what's right for you. So you've probably heard the statistic, men apply for a job when they meet 60% of the qualifications, but women apply only if they meet 100% of them. And it's usually followed up with some suggested evidence on women lacking confidence. 
in reality, there is definitely a lot of research uh, that points in the direction that women applied significantly less positions than men, but that's not necessarily due to lack of confidence. So some of the more recent research um, suggests that it's due to women taking more time finding the right role for them, and that there's also evidence that suggests that women have a higher success rate in securing those roles that they apply for um, due to taking that extra time. So I still very much believe that even if you don't match 100%, of the criteria, similar to what Maria had said earlier, apply and it, it's it's going to be worth it, especially even for the experience as well. Um, and you you might surprise yourself. And also, um, just don't worry about taking your time to discover and decide what you want at the same time. So, um, don't worry about sort of, yeah, take your time. <laughs> um, and then it's okay not to know something. So on all of our um job descriptions, we have nice to have, keen to learn. Um, so. If, for example, in research, we often look for machine learning and AI skills as a main need. Um, but as Maria mentioned, we also use C++ in our team. We know that a lot of machine learning candidates are heavily Python based. Um, but in the interview, those that show the interest, enthusiasm to learn C++, they tend to be set out um, from the rest. So we don't mind if you don't know something. There's a lot of technology out there. If you've got transferable skills and the attitude to adapt and develop, we'll work with it. And, and well, I would hope most companies are the same as us as well. So um, I definitely say if you don't know something, don't worry, those transferable skills will um, will definitely help as well, bring you up to speed. So this is a typical interview process of Foundry. Um, I would say this is a engineering role. However, we do non-engineering role, role as well, such as marketing, finance, operations, and et cetera. So let's see, so we, you would apply and the, and if your CV looks great, it will be me and Chloe C that does the talent team screen, which is about 30 minutes Zoom call. And then if you're happy, we will give you the technical task. I would say the biggest difference between Foundry and other tech companies that we don't do live pair coding session. We believe that that gives too much pressure on the candidates. So this is a task, um, take home task. We usually give out the weekend so that you can work on it for your own speed. And once our majors review the task and they are happy, we will do the main technical interview, which will be about two hours, one and a half hours ish. Um, and after that, once everyone is happy, you will be given the final stage interview. It's either with a senior manager or a peer interview. So these are the typical process that we go on and we aim to support all the candidates in the right stages. Um, for non-engineering roles, such as marketing, we still do tech um, task as well. So it could be depending on what we are looking for, but I would say these are the typical frame that we have at Foundry. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of interviewing at Foundry, um, research, research, research. So honestly, one of my slight pet hits uh, is when I ask a candidate what they know about Foundry and they have done zero research. I know we're the, the first people they're speaking to, but it, it's really important that if you want to impress the company that you're interviewing with and do your research, be able to show them that you are interested with us. It's a two-way process and it's a two-way interview. Um, soft skills. So work on the soft skills, soft skills like teamwork, collaboration, communication are so critical for us at Foundry. We look for those who are team players, but those who also aren't afraid to ask for help and those that really wanna make sure that their voice is heard. Um, take your time in the technical task. So as um, Chloe P mentioned in the last slide, we don't have time tasks at Foundry. So we don't want our applicants to feel pressured during our interviews. We want them to feel comfortable and able to put their best self forward. Um, so, often when it comes up to when you get a task you can get a bit swept up with excitement complete it as soon as you get it and often those tend to not do as well as those you'll take their time especially when it comes to checking grammar it's not just the technical skills that they're that we're, we're marking in those tasks, tasks it's how you've communicated the idea especially how you've communicated it for others to understand is often, often engineers will do code reviews and they need to understand each other's code. So that's really important. Um, so yeah, take your time on any task that you get when you're interviewing. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. So stay curious. Don't be afraid to ask questions. We want to see your passion for Foundry, for who we are, what we do. We want to tell you all about us and make sure that you understand our culture and values. So asking questions, again, will set you apart from a lot of candidates who don't or sort of just say, no, no questions. We're good. Um, so yeah, and then, yeah, you've got this. <laughs> um, so 
the gender gap. So why are we really here today? Um, from the education side, so the representation of women and non-binary people enrolled in consent has increased only slightly from 19% to 21 over the last five year periods, meaning it would take more than 30 years to reach parity following that trajectory. And um, the representation of women and non-binary people enrolled in engineering technology has moved from 21 in 2017-18 um, to 23 in 22-23. Again, continuing along that path means it would take more than 70 years to reach parity in the subject area. Um, when we're looking at the actual workplace, the representation, representation of women and non-binary people, according to the labour market data, shows an increase from 21% in 2016 to 26% in 2022-2023. Whilst this is a gradual increase, which is great to see, at that current rate of change, we're not going to see equal representation in um, STEM until the year 2070, which seems bad. Um, so it's clear that there is still a lot more to be done to reduce the, the gender gap in, in the STEM fields. And this part is really for us to sort of explain what we're trying to do about it or how we're sort of helping. Back to Chloe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as Chloe mentioned, that one of the roles the founder is playing to reduce the age gap is that we launched our first industry replacement software engineer last year. So we realized that to reduce the age gap, sorry, gender gap in engineering is that it's too late for the later stage. So say that I am looking for lead engineers and I look for the candidates, I can honestly say less than one out of 10 candidates are women. So we thought that's too late. We, we should start earlier stage. That's where this program came from. So when I launched it last year, uh, I would say about 20, 30% of applicants were female actually. And after all the process, we ended up hiring one male engineer and one female engineer which we are very proud of. Murray actually was part of the interviews last year and they started this September and I was told that they were doing an amazing job. Um, so this is one of the things that we are doing at Foundry as in we want them to get the role and then we train them and then hopefully they will get our permanent role next year and then they grow into mid-level and senior and lead engineers in the future. So that's one of the things the founder is looking for and happy to do so. And we actually open our uh, the second placement role this year, which we are very proud of. Uh, and then DIA at Foundry. So we, as part of our, our DIA action plan, we are committed to committed to focusing on learning education and hiring and recruiting. So just to touch on some of the things that we're doing at the moment internally, um, our DIA speaker series. So we launched this back in 22 and we're currently on our third season. Uh, the series is focused on sharing knowledge, experience, stories with our colleagues around some really important topics. So our most recent series covered topics such as transgender identity experiences, menopause, dyslexia, allyship. And um, in previous seasons, we've done a few topics on the likes of women tech, women in VFX, uh, focusing on the challenges and triumphs of, for some women in our company and our industry as well. Um, the series itself is internal at the moment, and it's really as part of our Foundry's internal DIA journey, but we're hoping to make some of those talks external as we grow as well. Um, then in terms of policy changes, we've made some really impactful changes um, to our internal apologies um, over the, the last few years around family leave, caregiving leave, as well as creating a policy for menopause to continue to support our women at Foundry as well. Um, and then lastly, why we're here today, uh, we are continuing to create and build our relationships with amazing partners like um, Girls on Tech and, and She Can Code. And this really enables us to make to make an impact by telling our team stories, by continuing the voice in the, uh, to be a voice in the industry and to really continue to, to build on, on those partnerships as well. Thanks, Chloe. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Should we... We only have one more slide. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and that's it. Um, it's, a, it's a very quick one. So education <laughs> is really big on the foundry. So we are providing our um, discount or free kind of um, products to following partnerships. So that schools or um, charity and so that we can help them to educate themselves with our program and then we're happy to help. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we'll... One minute for questions. Um, I know we had one from someone. Um, so it was around um, 
uh, hiring. So I sometimes also hiring for business roles. Uh, I'm in tech, but in marketing, for instance. Yes, yes, we hire for all roles. Um, so yeah, in our marketing teams, we we have an in-house marketing team. So we have lots of roles that um, come across from the content side of it, the industry side, um, our learning content team as well. So copywriters, everything. And then on the engineering side, our software engineers, our QAs, developers and tests. Um, essentially, there we have a whole host of ro- roles across the operations tech team and everything. So if you want to go to our QA um, on the QA, you can see a little bit more about the different teams that we have at Foundry um, and find out a little bit more about each of the, the areas that we recruit in. Great. Perfect. Um, I think we're on time, so I'll hand over to uh, Irene now. Perfect. Just a quick wrap up. Thank you so, so much to our speakers at Mairead. Chloe Park and Chloe Campbell, thank you so, so much. Um, we've all learned uh, a lot from you. And, you know, even those of us from Girls in Tech that we do a lot of these events continue to to learn. And this was um, uh, a great, a great session. So thank you all for participating. And I wish you um, a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.